the meeting. Um, just remind you all about your social distancing. Um, and today we'll be considering a briefing from the Mineral Products Association Northern <laughs> Ireland and also um, a number of pieces of subordinate legislation. I haven't received any apologies, but obviously you're aware that Martine Anderson has, has dialed in to the, the committee. I don't have any chairman's business. Um, moving then to the draft minutes at page six. These are the draft minutes of the meeting of the 10th <coughs> of June. Does anyone have any queries or are you content? Ms. Just one thing, it's Here. recorded that my stepfather was a, a quality manager for day six. It's quality rather than equality. Quality. Yes. Right. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay. Anything further? Members agreed? Thank you. Great. Moving then to matters arising <coughs> at page 11 of your packs. Uh, again, these are from the meeting of the 10th of June and they are listed um, accordingly. Do members have any issues in relation to <coughs> the note? Content? Yep. Okay, thank you. Then moving to page 13 and this is the outstanding um, committee requests for information. Just draw your attention to correspondence reference number 91, um, which we'd sent to the Department for Infrastructure just, um, it was on the 17th, we sent it actually on the 3rd of April, and the response was due on the 17th of April. Now, I know time has moved on and probably the issue has moved on, but we're still outstanding that piece of correspondence, which was particularly relevant um, at the time and I suppose in some ways does feed into some of the conversations that we're having around um, Hollier. So if you're content, <coughs> we'll send a reminder then to the department just in relation to that piece. Great. Great. Okay, thank you. Anything anything further you have or that you've noticed or noted? No? Nope. Okay, thank you. Content. Moving then to our briefing. Our briefing today is from the Mineral Products Association Northern Ireland and um, you'll find that at page 19 and they have provided um, a briefing paper. This is obviously one of a, a number of papers that we do actually either, um, receive um, periodically from MPA um, which is incredibly useful. Um, Hansard will be recording the, the meeting and can I kind of welcome uh, Mr Simon McDowell, the Chairman of the Mineral Products Association Northern Ireland and no stranger to committee members, um, Mr Gordon Best, the Regional Director of Mineral Products Association. Gentlemen, you're both very welcome um, to committee this morning and if you'd like to open with a, a statement and then members will follow up with, a, with some questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm Simon McDowell from Kilwater Minerals Limited, but I'm also chair of the Mineral Product Association Northern Ireland. So uh, I'll just give a very brief overview. It's a trade association for aggregates, asphalt, cement, concrete, dimension stone, lime, mortar, and silica sand industry. So Nor Northern Ireland needs a secure long term supply of mm -hmm. quarry products to enhance sustainable development and the member companies manufacture about 95% of the mineral products supplied to local construction and infrastructure sites. So we represent 82 companies in Northern Ireland, which is about 5,000, more than 5,000 employees, 160 extraction sites and deliver 22 million tonnes of material each year. Uh, it's just important to note the association is made up of members who are significant rural employers uh, and uh, that in turn helps numerous small communities across across the country. Uh, the, the industry is well respected and we have the industry helps the members with environmental and health and safety management so we're constantly trying to improve those and that then le lets us provide the quality of products to Northern Ireland and some of them further afield. So we have an excellent first-class uh, uh, record of service delivering these supplies wherever and whenever they're required. Um, so there's two, two main issues I just maybe point out before Gordon comes to his, his report. One is the challenges of Brexit, and hopefully we can, as an industry, work with all the political stakeholders together to make that transition as, as smooth as possible. Uh, and the other, as, as we know, is the COVID pandemic. 
and it's left uh, us all in very, very <coughs> uncertain times. So there's signs. We, ha we do have customers and markets that are open today, and there's, we're, we're back to nearly 70 to 80 per cent of where we were pre-COVID, but we're not sure what's going to come uh, to, to, towards the back end of the year. They may just be finishing projects that were already started, and we hope that maybe the government can help with some economic stimulus, uh, and whether that's in infrastructure spend or in the housing market, and that might help us all uh, get an economic recovery. So we're really pleased to take this opportunity to brief the Committee for Infrastructure today. It's vital that we all work together <coughs> and effectively progress our economy. Thank you. Thank you. Gordon? Okay. Uh, <coughs> Madam Chairman, it's great to be back. Uh, it's been a long time, uh, and I had a reflection this morning in coming here. I thought to myself, you know, while we're all faced with the COVID pandemic, uh, and in, both in business and, and in all our lives, there's there's many, you know, positive things that I'm I'm, I'm here to report today, and particularly our work with the, with the department, uh, not just in the COVID-19, but also with, uh, you know, maintaining our infrastructure. There, we've made great progress, and and. Uh, it's good to hear that the, the executive have announced that this is the final year uh, of, a, of a single year budget, and that's something that we've been calling on for, for quite a number of years. Uh, so that, that's very welcome. I'd, I'd like to give you some perspective of, of the impact of, of COVID-19 on our industry and, and what steps we, we, we have taken and, and what we're doing now. Uh, obviously in March, uh, when, when COVID-19 hit, uh, our members uh, took the appropriate and sensible step to withdraw their work voluntarily in many cases i have to say and services in order to protect and allay the the fears of our employees and at the height of the lockdown we had fallen probably till about 15 percent of normal activity uh, with almost 80 percent uh, of employees furloughed 10 percent were working from home and the remainder were working to provide essential uh, supplies to the farming industry, uh, ongoing health and COVID-19 projects, utility repairs, roads maintenance, and uh, the likes of water treatment, for example, uh, which is, is important, lime is important uh, for, for water filtration. <coughs> However, the shutdown time was not wasted uh, by many. Uh, <coughs> Collectively and individually, the industry set about reviewing risk assessments on every activity and developing new safe working methods. And after what has been a very gradual and staged return to work, levels of activity across the various sectors are back to between 70 and 80 percent, as Simon has highlighted. Uh, in April, at the request of the Department uh, of Infrastructure, our roads maintenance uh, contractors returned to work. Uh, again, in a very staged uh, and careful uh, process to complete existing works orders that had been there before COVID-19. That covered resurfacing works, minor works and patching. And on the 19th of May, uh, we were delighted that Minister uh, Malin gave her approval for the issuing of new works orders and resurfacing work uh, on the important <coughs> summer uh, surface dressing season. I'm delighted to report that uh, works orders are, are flowing, uh, the surface dressing is, is well underway, all under very strict COVID-19 social distancing requirements, and, and certainly I haven't had any negative reports whatsoever, and by all accounts it's, it's working very well. Uh, so we're at the time when I, I sent the, the updated briefing paper in, we were still waiting on confirmation of this year's budget, but it was good to hear the minister announce that she had been maintaining the levels of, of maintenance. And that's a good sign because over the last couple of years, you know, we, 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 we've started with an indicative budget of around 75 million, which has ended up on an, out, an annual outturn of, of, of in around 105, 106 million. And that has enabled, you know, money to be spent uh, during the, the good weather, during the summer time. And as I've often said, the, the, the industry pump is primed, and I think that's very important at this stage uh, with, with what we're looking forward to mm -hmm. into, the, into the later part of the year. And I think it's very important that uh, departments surrender any unspent money into the centre so that that money can be reallocated. And obviously, 
traditionally roads maintenance and maintenance of our water and sewage mm -hmm. infrastructure have been areas where you can get that money spent. And that, the other important aspect of that is that's uh, employ employment generating activity. And I think, as Simon says, that that's critical uh, at this stage. In terms of uh, like some of my colleagues from the Northern Ireland Construction Group are, are actually meeting with, with uh, Minister Murphy this morning, and, and one of the things that we're, we're uh, asking, uh, and I think it's something very relevant to this committee, that you know, we, we need clarity from all government construction clients and funding uh, for construction projects in, in 2021, and you know, how much has been spent to the end of May or June, how much is left for the rest of the year, and then how that uh, is going to be allocated in terms of areas of work or projects. And, and, and I think it is good to hear, particularly uh, Minister Mal and Minister Murphy, you know, uh, you know, calling for schemes to be brought forward. But what we need to see is action, really, because uh, sort of we, we had our, our uh, online AGM yesterday, and uh, quite a number of members were, were, were talking about fears for the fourth quarter of this year. The construction industry has returned to work uh, at the minute, uh, but it's completing work that was already there. And I have, you know, used the phrase about the need for the conveyor belt of decision making and the, the pipeline of, 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 of infrastructure work to flow. It is good to see that uh, plan, council planning is, is up and running, although it's very varied across uh, across uh, the province. Good to see that the PSC <coughs> introduced uh, virtual hearings. Good to see that the uh, land registry is up and running again. Our state agents are, are running, and I have to emphasise, and this has been something that has been highlighted, and not just in, in the UK, but I was talking to my colleague Jerry Farrell in the Irish Concrete Federation. You know, housing for our industry is, is going to be key to get the housing market going, and uh, it is good to see that. Uh, you know, builders are back uh, completing work, but we need to see. We need to have the you know, people need to have the confidence, and, and and that's a very difficult thing to to secure, given the the background and people's fears over over job redundancies, etc. But I think that getting a housing market uh, flowing is, is key, and I, and I would add to that. Obviously, before COVID nineteen, I know the committee were were very focused on the the water and sewage issue and the capacity issues here, I think that is, that is a critical thing uh, going forward that, 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 that we need to sort. Turning to planning then, as you know, uh, we have a, a long uh, working relationship with, with the department as, as well on in, in, in this. Uh, in, our brief, in our previous briefing paper, we had highlighted our concerns about the planning system in Northern Ireland, particularly the need to improve minerals planning. And we continue to work with the department and local council on these matters. The COVID-19 emergency obviously had a major impact on the deliver delivery of planning service, as understandable, uh, the safety of employees and prevention <coughs> of the spread of the virus took precedence. We are pleased to see that uh, the feedback from our members and the planning consultants that planning decisions are being made. And as I've said, uh, many of the, the, the agencies and, and uh, the parts of the planning system are, are, are up and running again, but still, when you look at the the, uh, the the planning statistics and major projects, the 30-week target, you know, it's still taking 54 weeks to deliver uh, major major projects. But then uh, again, then turning to our general relationship with the with with the department, uh, we have regular uh, quarterly meetings with senior officials. We we also have a a very uh, effective uh, health and safety working group uh, with the department which which looks at uh, all aspects of, of road worker road worker and, uh, and and the public safety traveling public safety as well in, in terms of signage and, and uh, traffic management uh, as well and and uh, i don't know if you remember or not but we've had a couple of very uh, effective social media campaigns in partnership with the department and the psni about driving safety, safely through roadworks and, and showing respect to road workers. And I have absolutely no doubt that that has saved uh, lives and, and has saved major major industry to, to our workers <coughs> and indeed to the, to the traveling public. Uh, in terms of uh, 
you know, the, net, the network itself, you know, I don't need to, sp to speak to members here. Many of you have been sat in previous uh, infrastructure and regional development uh, committees about the value of our of the asset that, that the department manages now worth some 40 billion. And, uh, you know, a number of in independent reports, and I, I, I did bring a copy of them out, you know, we've got the Snaith report from 2010, we've got the Barton report from 2018, we've got the, the NIO report uh, from, uh, from 2019, and basically uh, they're saying the same thing. We need to look after what we have. And, uh, you know, and, and roads maintenance isn't, isn't just about the looking after the the, 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 the travelling public in the car. It's about looking after cyclists. It's looking after public transport because our buses still have to travel on the roads, uh, motorcyclists, etc. So uh, we would we we have no issue uh, whatsoever uh, with with the the importance of public transport. In, in fact, when you know, if you think of the Greater Belfast area, obviously public transport is it has to take priority. There's absolutely no no doubt about that. But for me, it's 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 not a uh, them or us. It, it's about the, the priorities in certain areas, and, and and we still haven't completed our strategic roads network in the, in the rural areas and the A5, uh, the the A6 is ongoing, obviously. But a number of the the, the strategic bypasses around some of our, of our towns, though they, they can't be forgotten about. But certainly, I think the priority uh, has to be public transport and the pedestrianisation within within Belfast and the cut the cut emissions within Belfast. There's absolutely no doubt about that. So, at the minute, the structure and maintenance funding plan stands at a, approximately about 140 million. And over the last two years, as I've said, we've spent in around 105, 106 million, uh, thus adding to the shortfall. However, uh, one of the things the department's own figure shows is that for every pound we spend below that structured maintenance funding plan that actually costs the, the Northern Ireland taxpayer £1.26, as unmaintained roads run a greater risk of having to be reconstructed. And I think there is universal agreement, as I've said, that the introduction of multi-year budgets would go a long way to delivering much better value for money. Uh, it will facilitate better planning, uh, better investment, uh, and that, of course, results in better quality in, uh, of the roads network. Uh, so, in terms of our water and sewage, again, I know that the committee have, have, have looked at this in, in, in depth. Uh, you know, the, water, the water strategy was published uh, last year. Uh, MPA believe that a solution must be identified to uh, averting a funding crisis for this vital infrastructure, because it's quite simple. If we can't connect uh, pipes to water infrastructure, then we won't be able to build the new homes or hotels for tourism. New schools, new health infrastructure, society needs. So, uh, the capacity crisis, if not urgently addressed, will definitely impact on the delivery of city deals. Uh, and the the the, uh, the well-known phrase now from NI Water: "No drains, no cranes." In terms of the delivery of outstanding uh, projects like the F5 and, and York Street Junction and the completion of the, the strategic road. Networks, you know, we, we do need a, we do do need to do better, and you know the the, the decision making process in Northern Ireland, uh, I, I firmly believe, isn't working. Uh, you'll see in the paper we have called for, uh, along with the, the Construction Employers Federation, the uh, the, the the need for a, a, a an independent uh, strategic uh, delivery unit within the. Uh, executive and, and the government departments here, similar to the NFDA in the south and, and Scottish Futures Trust, because uh, we, we the, the, the Northern Ireland Audit Office report and the, the capital projects certainly identified major problems in the, the procurement and delivery process. So, in terms of our call for a review of of planning, uh, we. Uh, we opposed the uh, the dilution or the the the, 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 the given of, of, of mineral planning and waste planning to the councils because we felt a, a, a specialised unit within the department, the DOE, at that time, you had 15 people within a, an expert uh, unit, and for that to be diluted, 
uh, around the eleven councils was going to result in, 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 in problems, and <coughs> I think you know that that is now uh, manifested itself in many respects. And we believe that after five years, uh, six years almost, it's maybe time for a review and the likes of mineral planning and uh, waste planning uh, needs to be you know, maybe given to a, a shared service. Uh, Within the council, so in the same way that the that the environmental services is, is, is now dealt with uh, through uh, Mid and East Antrim, we, we we would like we would like to see that because we've, as I've said, we, we're we're despite the, the work that we're doing with with the the local councils, there is a well, we see there's a, there's a lack lack of expertise. I don't think we have actually one qualified mineral planner, and. You know that that's vitally important. You know our aggregate resources, our, our vital metals, are critical to the economic uh, future of, of the country. And, and even you know, if you take into the, the context of Brexit, you know we're now uh, a few months away from becoming a, an inverted commas an independent country uh, outside of the EU. Now, if the one thing that COVID nineteen teaches us, particularly around the the PPE. When there's a crisis, <coughs> you're on your own. And, like for example, we don't have any. Uh, you know, we probably have copper resources in the ground, but we've no copper mining <coughs> in in, uh, in in the UK. You know, for our, our future fossil free, uh, zero carbon future, the likes of copper, lithium, zinc are critical. You know, as we move wind uh, power offshore, we're going to need more copper. We're going to need better quality copper. We're going to need uh, for our uh, electric vehicles lithium. Now, if, if we get into another crisis and, and, and uh, sometime in the future, and we don't have our own access to those those metals, we, we could we could we could have problems. So that leads on to, uh, to our our request. We've been pushing for this for quite a number of, of years. Is the need for a, a Northern Ireland Minerals Forum, where issues around mineral planning. Uh, Resource identification uh, can be addressed. Uh, this will be similar to the, the UK Minerals Forum, uh, which is, is uh, has been going now for uh, about ten years. I sit on it. There's a representative from the uh, the Department of the Economy sits on it as well. But around that table, you have industry from the aggregate sector, from from various uh, other mineral sectors. You have the Wildlife Trusts. You have like the RSPB, Natural England, and while. The industry, the minerals industry, and, and uh, those organisations won't see eye to eye on everything. At least you can sit around a table and discuss them, and you meet in the middle. And that's what we need. There's far too many issues in Northern Ireland to address on social media. You know, we need to have a, we need a proper engagement uh, with, with all interests in place. Because, at the end, I'm a great believer. You know, we're all caretakers. You know, we should leave this place in a better place than we found it. And uh, having the structures to actually de debate uh, issues that can be at times contentious is, is, is the way forward. And we, we think that a we think that a, a, a minerals forum a, 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 a would be a, a great addition to that that, that, that debate. Uh, one of the other issues that I've raised with with the the, 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 the committee in the past, and indeed I've, I've raised with the, the, the chairperson uh, Michelle. Uh, you know, before this is, is the need. We're very supportive of the introduction of uh, the review of old mineral planning permissions. Now, in 2011, it was in the uh, it was in the planning bill, but it has never been enacted. And, and I have to put our, our hands up. But you know, we were uh, one organisation that, that 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 lobbied at that time that we didn't feel it was appropriate because at that time, if you recall, we were. Hit by the recession, we lost 50% of our employees. We've lost 50, dropped 50% 50 in terms of, of production, uh, and the introduction of ROMS at that time could have been a, a sledgehammer to crack a nut. However, during that time, we have took the opportunity through our, our planning agents and, and uh, with our members to get the industry to uh, make, you know, when they're going for extensions. Uh, and a lot of them have, and most of the most most planning applications in Northern Ireland in our industry are are small extensions. So what we said to them was, you know, when you're putting in an extension, draw the red line around the whole site and get it EIA compliant to meet future ROMPS requirements. And never did we believe. We thought maybe it, it would have took maybe two or three years to get ROMPS 
uh, brought in. Never did we believe that in 2020 we'd be still waiting for it. Mm. And unfortunately, with the recovery of the uh, with the construction industry, uh, the <coughs> failure of introducing ROMs has created the situation where people who have never been, uh, you know, associated with the industry, have went into old disused quarries where you've had. Uh, an old, there's an old permission, you know, even going back to the 19, 1960s, no environmental conditions whatsoever, uh, and been able to operate. And that has caused, uh, in, in a number of areas, you know, consternation and, uh, with, with, with neighbours, and, and I can understand exactly where they're, where they're coming from. In fact, one of the, the quarries, I actually went and met the neighbours myself. Uh, what was that? That's all right. <laughs> okay, uh, there's somebody agreeing with you there. <laughs> the, uh, so we're very supportive of the, of the introduction because it's, it, it's just totally unacceptable. For example, the, the S6, uh, uh, the Dungiven, uh, Drumahoe section, uh, there's material going into that job from one of those reactivated sites. And yet we have, uh, in, in fairly close proximity, we have two of our best quarries, you know, which has health and safety accreditations, environmental accreditations, biodiversity action plans, and yet they're seeing material going from a site that has no modern environmental conditions uh, whatsoever, and that's just totally unacceptable. And that's why we're very supportive of, uh, we want to see the, the transport hub in Belfast, you know, uh, uh, fast-tracked, because the sustainable procurement plan within the, 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 the transport hub is based on BES 6001, which is the standard for responsible sourcing. And it's our belief that, that every load of aggregate, every, every uh, load of concrete going into that, and any, any project, particularly public sector projects, should be coming from responsible sources. So that's really me. So happy, we're happy to take Okay. Any questions? Thank you very much, and that was that was very thorough, and um, I, in some ways you've co covered quite, oh, no. <laughs> quite a lot of probably what we were we were maybe wanting to explore. Yeah. But thank you for that anyway. Um, you obviously you mentioned the at the start of the COVID um, pandemic, obviously a number of quite a number of your um, contractors then voluntarily um, left jobs and, and contracts at that stage, um, and I appreciate and I, and I know you're very positive about your relationship with the department. Mm -hmm. But I also know that there was a lack of communication probably in that early time with regards to perhaps guidance that was being given from the department. Had that been earlier coming, um, would more contractors have been able to remain on site and actually continue on with their jobs if they were more aware of maybe um, the health and safety risks and also maybe what restrictions they could have put in place in order to allow work to continue? I would be loath to criticize anyone you know going back to that the start of march you know because it, it hit the department the same way as it hit our industry we didn't know we didn't know anything about the, the you know the, the virus mm. uh, but the one thing we were sure sure of with with, with our employees and, and certainly the feedback that i got as director of the association was that there was you know the fear was palpable out there in the community you know where we had workers, whether it be out in the uh, in any of the, the road surfacing squads or or even in, in the quarries, you know, people who had young children at home or maybe their their spouse or, or a relative who was vulnerable, they didn't want to run any risk, and uh, the companies took the, the the right decision. Look, you know, we need to step back here and assess what, what, where, where this is going and. and you know, we, we had to, you know, one of the things about our industry, you know, health and safety is the top priority. I, I would certainly argue that in terms of the wider construction and as we lead the field, you know, the mineral sector lead the field in, in, uh, in, in health and safety. And to, to us, this was another major uh, health and safety issue in the same way as protecting people against, you know, dust or moving machinery, where we had to step back. We had to risk assess again. We had to develop new working practices. And that's what we did. And uh, we then sat down when the department realised, you know, that, that there was there was unfinished work. That there, you know, there was budgets that had to be that had to be spent. There was many aspects of road surfacing that that, that could be done uh, safely. Uh, for example, uh, you know, the the 
laying lay on, lay on asphalt uh, or laying bitmac, bitmac in particular, where you don't have a, a chipping machine and, and more people uh, around, but certainly laying lay blacktop or even patching, you know, uh, uh, social distancing uh, could be delivered very effectively. Uh, when those risk assessments were, were done, the, the, uh, the, the guys were in touch with the various uh, sections and, and divisions. Those new risk assessments were assessed, and, and certainly at, at our last uh, meeting with, with the department there, the Chief Health and Safety uh, Manager uh, said they were uh, excellent, you know, the, 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 the new work, safe and working methods. When you see the steps that were taken to, you know, section off and uh, compar uh, decarpmentalize the, the, the vans. That has even moved now from the early days where each, each compartment has its own air circulation. Uh, so there's been a lot of innovation has gone on, the use of, you know, uh, PPE as well. And in fact, you know, our, our, and I think I maybe even sent you copies of this, but our, the, the guidance that our, our, uh, our industry uh, developed has been recognised as some of the best of, of any uh, business sector. So there's been a lot of work that's gone in uh, with the department in, 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 in uh, assessing risks and assessing the, the, new, the new safe working practices. And the, you know, as I said earlier, the feedback so far, we've been back, what, three weeks? And genuinely, there's been no n negative feedback. Okay, it's all been very positive. I've actually seen men back at work and obviously progressing with, with a number of contracts. And I, I, I know that I passed a number actually on my way here today, actually, which was, which was, which was good to see. And I noticed the reduction actually even in the number of personnel around some of the, uh, of the sites too, mm -hmm. which is obviously part of that. Budget is obviously um, an ongoing issue and probably will continue to be. Um, and obviously the, the minister um, announced um, some of the projects that she's committed to over the, over the next year, which will be obviously a benefit to you, be that setting aside flagship projects which have their own challenges, be that judicial reviews and, uh, and, and so on. We do have other... Um, with rural roads commitment um, mm -hmm. and also park and rides and so on too, which will require um, a, a considerable amount of um, of work. Um, you had obviously the, the discussion around um, multi-year budget, something that, which has been going on for a considerable time, <coughs> and the challenge that you had around single year and particularly around monitoring rounds too, yes. where you've been waiting and then in a very short period of time then having to um, to adapt practice. Obviously, we're still in that that cycle. Um, what notification do you need? in order to be able to um, to complete a project? Because I think around this table, I suppose, maybe, and we maybe have unrealistic expectations of, of of when works should be carried out and how quickly they should be done. Well, we, we've always uh, been of the view, and I've communicated this many, many times, and the, 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 uh, the, the permit secretary, the, the, the director of Roads and Rivers fully understands, uh, haven't seen themselves you know, and visited, you know, the, uh, the production sites and the quarries, uh, that the capital investment <coughs> that goes into producing the materials for training the skilled workers. So there, there's a certain, uh, there's a need there for certainty uh, of budgets uh, going forward so that companies can invest mm -hmm. in new plant and machinery, new products, uh, and in training and, and skill. And we've always are, are, been arguing <coughs> the point that you know, the, the sooner we get surety at the start of the year, uh, the better. And uh, as I said earlier about the need to, to front load the budget and get as, as high a, uh, an, an indicative budget at the start. Because when you think about it, you know, you know the, the likelihood in, in, in these times of achieving that 140 million uh, is questionable. But if you get, if you get the, the budget front loaded, you get the money spent, in the during the good good weather uh, th through the through the summer and, and into the autumn, uh, that can actually deliver as good a value for money, you know, as, as, as that probably that 140 million. Uh, what we hope to do this year, and, and, and this could, you know, if if money is surrendered surrendered in a, in a timely fashion, this could be a, a, a good year, you know, for mm. roads maintenance uh, if, if, if we can reallocate uh, money into that. And we, we'll, we could make a, a, a major uh, input into addressing that, that uh, underspend over the years. But I think it's critical, you know, for 
know, it, it, it's if, if if you were a private business and, and you weren't uh, and you had an asset worth significant millions of pounds and you weren't properly maintaining that asset, your shareholders would would have something to say to you at the on, annual general meeting. Okay. Um, you mentioned the, the specialised construction project delivery unit, um, and obviously that was a, a recommendation from back in 2012. No doubt you've had numerous conversations in, in relation to that. I mean, what has been the resistance to it? I think, I think in the past, it, it, it's, it's maybe just down to our political system here, maybe, you know, where if each permanent secretary and each minister, uh, maybe from a different party in a certain uh, department and there's this assumption that by surrendering the right to procure and uh, deliver the construction fades if it's fades of a hospital or a school that you're somehow losing uh, responsibility for that but that's not the case at all it's, if it was an education minister or a health minister that minister still decides of the when uh, were uh, and, 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 and what what type of facility you're going to build when it, but when it comes to the actual procurement and the construction delivery of it it's handed over to uh, a specialized uh, you know ac expert construction delivery unit that's, that, that, that's uh, populated by people from a construction background and that's that's how it works in, in the south that's how it works in the, in the in Scotland okay thank you mr Boylan Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation, Gordon and Simon. You're very welcome. Um, I've just had three main points to make. But Gordon, would you, your industry definitely has an opportunity to kickstart the economy again and play your part of it. There's no doubt because of the show. But I just wanted your full assessment because the, the, the structural maintenance budget itself, I mean, it's to remain the same level as last year. Can, can you dig into a, a full assessment of that? Because you mentioned the SNAITH report, we're, we're going on a long time in terms of. We've identified, identified especially the rural roads maintenance programme, and I mean, um, whilst there's been good work done over the last number of years, mm -hmm. there's still a lot to be done. Mm -hmm. but just your overall assessment on that. Um, the other one, the other two points I want to make. One of them is definitely the ramps issue, and I'm I'm a wee bit concerned about the the opening of these quarries. I'm not I'm not challenging the people in doing that. I, I think you've mentioned there the council <coughs> have the powers, and and it's just not working, and it's not a. It's not a blame game, it's just how we, mm -hmm. because those environmental standards that we fought very hard, and, and you certainly in your organisation down through the years have, have fought very hard to introduce the environmental standards and work and, and try and get that balance um, to bring forward those, those standards. Um, and I have a wee bit of concern about that. So see your overall assessment of the number of sites, <coughs> and does that present a big challenge for us in terms of the old sites have been opened up and the cross tie then with the council? How the council um, are dealing with that, and how plan is dealing with that. And, yep. and the other point, finally, as you're saying in your in your brief about the four thousand lorry loads per day, <coughs> of an interest, obviously, in the decarbonisation. Would you like to talk on how the, we could move <coughs> that process forward in terms of the HGVs? But that's that's the three key points I'd like to bring up. Sure. Thank you. Okay. In terms of the the, the the budget, I think the rural roads. The ten million pounds uh, allocated to the rural roads project is, is excellent. You know, when I think it was Chris Hazard, when he was a minister, uh, introduced a rural roads uh, fund, uh, and that uh, that was very effective. Got money spent quite very quickly and made a big uh, uh, improvement in the condition of many of our, of our worst r rural roads. And you got to remember that to, I think, uh, of the the twenty thousand. 27,000 kilometres of roads, I think 25,000 of that is deemed rural roads. And it was interesting in the audit office report, it actually highlighted the <laughs> fact that the, the trunk road network condition had improved, but the rural road network had continued to, to decline. Uh, so the, the 10 million, it could be an argument saying it's 10 million enough, you know, uh, it'll, it'll probably need another one maybe. In terms of 10 million and other roads, rural roads uh, initiative b before the end of the year. So no, that, that that has been good. And as I've said, you know, roads are always going to come behind health and, and education, and we, we have to accept that. But we you know we need to look after the <coughs> the, the network, and it's as simple as that. Because if, if we don't, as I've said earlier, 
it, it'll turn in, if we're not maintaining it, it'll turn into re, re, uh, reconstruction, which, you know, be all accounts is about five or six times the, the expense. Uh, in terms of the ramps, yeah, uh, some of these old sites that have opened up have obviously created a lot of opposition in, in, in local areas. The councils do have powers through the Clean Neighbourhoods <coughs> Act to act, to act on them, but I think there, there's a certain uh, hesitancy in, in many areas o over the certainty of, well, you know, around the type of permissions, you know, the, the, the records on some of these old sites, some of them don't, probably don't even exist. So I think we need to, a clean slate, to be, to, be, to be totally fair, and that, that any, any uh, of these old, old sites that, uh, that are reactivated, they have to, they have to uh, follow uh, the same uh, steps as any other. Uh, or you'll have to do, and, and whether that's EIA assessment uh, and, and uh, the application of modern, <coughs> up-to-date environmental standards, uh, you know, it's a level playing field. That's that's what we're like. That's what we're in the business for as a trade body is to ensure a level playing field uh, across the <coughs> across the, the, the country. And, and well, we don't have that at the minute, you know. And uh, it, 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 that needs addressed urgently. The, the, there's not a large number of them, no, but that that's small that's number <coughs> cr yeah. creates this unlevel playing yeah. field. And the <coughs> compliance costs for the good operators is there and the compliance cost for these is maybe not there so it just upsets upsets okay. the market badly for a very small number that's a very important point because uh, uh, you know i said earlier about the capital investment that goes into running a proper compliant uh, operation and as simon rightly says these guys that, that, that go in and open these old sites don't have that you know and, and it's, it's just not it's just not right it's as simple as that. We need we need to address it uh, as soon as possible. I'm glad you raised the the the, the point about the decarbonisation. Yeah, in across the UK, we move our industry moves about a million tons a, uh, a day. In Northern Ireland, we move about eighty thousand tons a day. That's four thousand lorry loads. If you park those together, they stretch from Belfast to Dungannon. That sort of gives you an impression of the importance, an indication of the importance of our industry in terms of keeping the economy. Uh, however, that obviously has a, a major environmental impact in terms of climate change. Uh, I think transport is around 24% of Northern Ireland's uh, carbon emission figures. We are now in uh, conversations with the likes of Phoenix Gas uh, in terms of transition to the car, uh, compressed uh, natural gas. But we're also in the one thing that, that, that that really excites me is, is is the 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 drive towards hydrogen, and I think there's a real opportunity for our industry. You know, most of you know what a quarry is like. We have you know huge resources of wind and water, and uh, there's a number of our quarries actually have wind turbines, which is quite unique in the UK. Because when I had the Treasury over here uh, earlier on uh, last la last year. Uh, they remarked that many of the quarries in, in England that had been in had never seen a wind turbines up, and uh, we have a number of members that have wind turbines, and they're 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 generating about 50% of their energy requirements to you know crush and screen the stone, but they have to sell that uh, <coughs> surplus uh, wind energy, renewable energy, back into the grid at the uh, about a I think about a th third uh, half of, of what they're buying it for. And uh, when the, 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 the discussion around hydrogen uh, came in, we, we thought, well, here's an opportunity. We have used resources of wind, huge <coughs> resources of water. If we put in uh, uh, electrolyzers, we could start to create our own, our own hydrogen. And you know, the discussions are going on with the, the plant manufacturers now to see how, how quickly they're moving, you know, with like <coughs> Caterpillar, JCB, uh, uh, Hitachi, all, all those other large uh, quarry <coughs> plants. So there, you, you can picture the, you know, the, the scenario where quarries could actually become hydrogen hubs in the rural community, <coughs> using that resource of wind energy and, and water that we have to, to generate uh, zero uh, carbon uh, fuels. Now you think about the impact that would have, not just on the, our, our carbon emissions, 
part of that 24 percent of the transport but the, the you know we're using clean green energy to manufacture our construction products what that would do to the carbon uh, footprint of our built environment as well so it's an exciting opportunity <coughs> it's it's in its early days but we're fully committed to it and just finally chair on the point of the ramps see you mentioned a forum earlier on yeah the, the deal with the, all that the i mean who, who do you foresee <coughs> obviously government but who do who do you foresee the players in that forum? Well, I would say similar to what the UK minister, you know, it would be the uh, the, the, the wildlife, uh, the, the, the green NGOs would be part and parcel of that. Ourselves as industry, probably other, the construction industry, we depend on our products and again, you know, uh, representatives from uh, yourselves and, and, and assembly. Okay. Thank you. Obviously, um, Gordon and I have had a conversation in relation to Rumps, and I'm, I'm aware of a site, and we have a ridiculous situation where um, a disused site and um, planning permission was given then for, for new build properties on the periphery of that site. The site has now reopened, and blasting and so on has caused structural damage. Residents have difficulty getting insurance. So, I mean, there's a really a lack of thought and long term planning in and around this. Um, and certainly, I'm very supportive um, of that review. Uh, Mr. Hildage. Thanks, Chair and gentlemen. You're very welcome to the committee this morning. Not often we have two, two East Andrew men before us, so <laughs> you are very welcome indeed. Uh, I would like to just start off by paying tribute to the industry and indeed the, the workers in general because they're often through a particularly difficult time. But the, the workers in the industry have always been to the fore and obviously will play a, a major part in us getting up and running again as, as we try to get back to some normality. Um, the planning issues that you hi highlighted in relation to it maybe not working in your favour as such, Gordon, uh, as, you, as you'd indicated, we're five or six years down the road from planning going to the local councils, and I suppose your fears of the watering down of expertise, is it's quite worrying to hear about that. Um, is, is there anything on the periphery that you see could happen there, uh, how things could change. Uh, are you work at, maybe the universities could be looking into potential jobs even in that sector if, if there's a lack of expertise in that area? Mm -hmm. well, well, certainly we, as an, uh, as an association, we haven't sitting our hands on it, uh, Mr. Hildes, but we, <coughs> we have been in discussion with Milga, for example, uh, mm -hmm. in the past. Uh, through Nilga and the, Inst the UK Institute of Quarrying. Uh, the Institute of Quarrying have a, a mineral planning course that was delivered to the planning uh, officers and the, the local authorities in England. That was delivered here in Northern Ireland back in, I think, 2016-17. And with 31 local planning officers went, officers went through that. And that really covers the whole aspects of, of you know, the industry, why it's important, the, the importance of EIA, habitats, etc., and the contribution that, that, that industry can make to you know, uh, biodiversity, for example. Uh, we, that that w was successful. I, I think I'm a great believer in that, that w whether it be planning, health and safety, whatever, if people are making decisions on your industry, they're part of it. And we all have an obligation to make sure that, that the people are who are making decisions uh, are doing that on the basis of <coughs> professionalism and competency. And uh, we, uh, you know, we look further forward to uh, further discussions with Nilga, particularly around the like uh, awareness training for local rep elected representatives, for example, uh, about our industry. Uh, and, and I know that the Institute of Quarrying are developing a, a course to be delivered in, in the in the in GB on that. And I even talking to my colleagues in the south, you know, this isn't this isn't a unique thing for for for, for Northern Ireland. It, it, it's it's all over because uh, of the drifts. It's just going to get the steelmate point. But Backlog after backlog of applications, you know. It's just mm. Well, that's that's all. That, that's all, always a worry. And I'm aware that the, the department have taken steps over the last year and a half to address competency issues with, within the local councils, and I know they're working closely with 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 Nilga and that. And and, and I think that's very positive. And, and hopefully that'll, you know, that'll that'll show uh, in the future with with uh, the again. Statistics don't lie, you know. The fact that, as I highlighted earlier, you know, decision times are are, are far too long, 
and we and we we need to we need to address that. And even at a at a lower level, like we, we're you know we're constantly in, in conversation with the likes of NIEA, the likes of Roads and Rivers, and in, in terms of their you know their car, you know their their responses to to the planning applications and, and you know asking you know the people that are making responses to these uh, applications have they the pr proper qualifications have the proper experience to do so. Because that, if they don't, that slows up the whole. That slows up the whole process. I think in the last three months there's been even a worse situation then. Uh, absolutely. There's been very little movement then, probably. Yeah. Well, in, in the early days there was the whole issue of, of access, you know, with, with with people working from home, you know, access to the planning portal, etc., and that that caused a lot of problems as well. Oh, okay. But the best of my knowledge, I think that has been that has been addressed. Thank you. Well, one of the issues is that different councils seem to work at different speeds and put different conditions on. Yeah. So within what is a relatively small country, Northern Ireland, we have uh, members with differing issues through the similar planning system. Seven different versions, basically. <coughs> yes. Good point. Yep, indeed. Uh, you referred also to the audit <coughs> office report on the sort of the delay in the delivery of capital projects. I know the. Public Accounts Committee, which is declaring interest, we're looking at that currently about to pick it up again after a bit of a break there due to the COVID. Uh, but it, there, there's a lot of criticisms within that, and a specialised construction project delivery unit is probably some that hopefully will come out of it. But do you feel that the sector, the industry itself, has, has something to learn from that report? Particularly where yet delivery and that goes as well. Is there any part that the industry think that you have played in it? Do you think no? Uh, I never really give that much thought, to be honest. But I suppose there's always the question of you know, well, and, and many of these delays, industries responsible for taking you no know, legal action. You know, That's so, you know that, yeah, well, yeah. Ex exactly. But I, I believe you know, legal legal action isn't a, a step. Company and which, which uh, as a trade body, for the likes of ourselves, or the, uh, don't want to speak for the CEF, but they're, they've been the same. But we have no control over what a, a private company does. That's their decision. But you know, looking looking from the outside in, you know, taking a, a step to take legal chance is not a it's 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 not a cheap uh, road to go down. You yeah. know, and I think we're still we're still labouring in Northern Ireland to get a, a a fair, transparent, clear procurement system. And that, that work, you know, continues, and I think until we we uh, we do, you're al you're always going to get uh, the, the the risk of of legal challenge. Just to get all these sort of ducks ending up in a row, like the planning delay, the legal delays, and it just all keeps <coughs> shooting down the, mm -hmm. the the road, should I say? Uh, there's a fear for the fourth quarter. You mentioned as well yeah. all, off the year. Would is there? What's your view of shovel-ready projects at the minute? They're they're very few and far between in the ground. Or, well, <coughs> no, I, I don't I don't. There's, there was talk of, of the the A5 might be kicking off the latter part of this year. I think what we need, you know, people talk maybe sometimes about the big big projects and, and those big projects are important, but even even the likes of you know, take the the the, the uh, likes of. DFI roads and rivers, you know, even like small scale minor works type work, you know, that are employee intensive. Mm. Uh, you know, th that's critical. We were just Sam and I were just talking about this before we came in, and and uh, and uh, it was the discussion yesterday uh, at our meeting was, you know, we need to bring forward employment gener in the short term employment generating uh, projects uh, that's going to soften. You know, because we are, we're going to, we're going to have a rough time, uh, you know, come the, the, the autumn, because the, uh, the, the as I said earlier, the, the industry's back, completing work that was already there, that was planning permission had been p passed. So you go and talk to a number. Of, how many, how many builders are you seeing at the minute actually open up, opening up new brownfield sites? They're finishing their old sites because e even with, you know, and I was talking to an estate agent last week. There, there's, there's a great fear out there because of the, the threat of maybe redundancies and, and, and job losses. So people are maybe, you know, hesitating. Could uh, be some sort of void come the autumn at, at, at their time. Yeah. There, there certainly could be. And I think there's another issue around insurance that I can't say definitively if, if 
if, if it's been a direct effect of COVID, but you know, you, you take a, the likes of trade credit insurance, where the Treasury have had to step in to give you know a 10 billion uh, guarantee. Uh, you know, you've got a number of underwriters there that are. Many people see them acting unscrupulously, and you know, some people say, you know, is there a new breed of people in the insurance industry that that have lost the, the plot that they, they don't realise that risk is their business. Uh, and that's what they're in the business of, you know, and it seems to be a lot of insurance industry now don't want to, you know, uh, price risk. And, you know, for example, suppliers in GB, suppliers are supplying people here who then pass on materials to uh, contractors here, particularly in the, in the uh, construction and engineering sector, are being hit with, with, with their credit terms being wiped. Now, if a company in Northern Ireland uh, are being asked to put money up front before they supply a contractor. Given the fact that the, during the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, they have had to dip into their company reserves to, you know, to keep the company going. You know, the rug, any, any, there's a real risk, uh, and this is really just developing around this trade uh, credit issue. There's a real risk that the rug could be pulled from under any uh, green shoots that could come out in the short term because of this. And I think. Uh, government, and I think this is maybe one for the MPs, is, is there needs to, pressure needs to be put on government to put the pressure on these underwriters uh, who are underwriting the, the risk for the for the construction industry to to really you know to stand up and, yeah. and, and do what they're supposed to be doing. Good point. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Sorry, just one final point. Then obviously they mentioned the supply of lime, the the water and sewage. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of this sort of stuff goes over, or sorry, under the radar of a sort of the lay person on the street. Uh, could you tell us a wee bit more just about the supply of the lime to the, the water? So the supply of lime for Northern Ireland water is mainly hydrated lime. So it's uh, take calcium carbonate and then you burn it and add water and you create a hydrated lime to change the pH. And the producer of hydrated lime is in Carlo in the Republic of Ireland. And then that product's brought up and, and used by Northern Ireland Water for the pH correction. <coughs> That's one of the main ones. Is that the only supplier of it then? Is it? Yeah. There's only one in the island of Ireland, so you can either bring it in a truck from England or buy it in, in, in Carlo. Carlo. That's an interesting <coughs> point. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good okay. solution. <coughs> Thank you. I think Sorry. I th sorry. I, th I think the one point is, you know, for, for 25 years, our, our industry and association has been on to highlight the, 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 the making the link and the essential nature of our industry. And I think this crisis has, you know, made people realise, you know, uh, supply cannot be assumed. You know, that that that, that our industry, you know, is, is a key, and, and and we were we were on the Department of the Economy essential uh, activity list. You know, which I think is reflective of that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Uh, again, I'd like to pay tribute to your members and their responsible ac actions uh, th that occurs. And, and again, I agree with you. There are key areas that you produce that people don't, they just take for granted. I mean, toothpaste, food additives, there's a wide range of, pro of products that are required uh, in order to meet the consumer's requirements. Um, go going back to the planning legacy issues. Um, where I mean, it was highlighted there's a degree of unfair competition and it allows the irresponsible old uh, quarry to be reopened and undercut the, uh, the other quarries who are operating to higher environmental standards. Can you illustrate the sort of shortcuts that can occur or damage to the environment that results from such old legacy quarries reopening? What sort of things are happening there? Well, I, th I think it all, it all it all stems around the application of proper modern environmental standards in terms of water management, dust management, uh, screening, for example, operating hours, uh, visual impact. You know, th just the normal stuff that you would normally get in a in a in a, in a modern fuel pl bonding. planning, F fuel bonding, for example, that type of thing. You, you indicated that. There's been a dilution in, in the specialist knowledge with, the, the, if you like, the decisions going to each council. And is it because of the lack of expertise that perhaps some of the councils may be reluctant to take action because they, they don't perhaps know their powers as well as they might do if there was a specialist unit? 
Do you think a specialist unit would help if, if there was a concentration of expertise in this area? Oh, so I certainly, I certainly think the the a specialist unit would, would, would certainly help in, in terms of uh, you know knowledge of the industry, knowledge of uh, environmental uh, requirements, uh, whether it be EIA Habitats Directive, yeah. and just general general experiences. It's like any. Role, Roy. It, it, it's if, if you're confident in, in what you do, you'll you'll make a decision. If people aren't comp unconfident or haven't uh, enough experience in what to do. They'll delay or they'll pass the buck to somebody else, and that's the problem. And 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 you made reference to a mineral planner. I mean, does Northern Ireland civil service have a mineral planner? We we. Well, the, uh, um, the minerals policy of, of uh, responsibility, mineral planning, has all been handed over to the councils. Now, I have to say we've had excellent engagement with, with the councils, uh, particularly around the areas of uh, safeguarding and identifying future reserves and uh, identifying you know, proper, proper policies going forward. Uh, that, that has been very positive. So uh, there is no, the, the best of my knowledge, prop, you know, officially qualified mineral planner. This isn't a problem just in Northern Ireland, but we don't have a, a qualified mineral planner, to the best of my knowledge, in Northern Ireland, as, as would be. And I think the last one we had was, was Jeff Harbison back in the, in, the, in the 90s, and Jeff's retired now. Uh, it's, a, it's an issue, it's an issue in, in, in GB, and I know the, the industry in GB are taking it up with the likes of universities and with the, the organisations like the Royal Town Planning Institute, and it's critical. Like the, this, this is you know we're a supply sector to the to the the, the country to the economy. It's an, it's vitally important that we have you know competent people in key decision making areas that that that, that at, at, at the end of the day that the, the the country depend on these supply chains. Finally, then, if I may, in terms of specialist construction project delivery unit. Again, as uh, colleague Mr. Hillage was saying, uh, this is an issue that's coming up in other committees. Um, that um, uh, a push towards this direction. Um, <clears throat> can you indicate the, the benefits to the public purse in having such a unit? What do you see? What's the benefit to your members, and what can you see the benefit to the public purse? Just quickly, I, th I think the, f the obvious one would be that uh, speeding up delivery, obviously. Uh, Reduces delays. Delays cost money. Uh, I would I would like to think that a specialised unit would be procuring and delivering in a way that would reduce the likelihood of legal challenge, and therefore you would be saving money in that regard. S some have indicated if there was a specialised unit, there'd be more consistency in in tendering, and tendering costs would go down. And legal challenges might might go down, but also the risks to all involved would go down. And as such, the safety margin of, ha, doesn't have to be built in for those tendering, so that actually the cost of public purse might go down. Does that ring true? I think all the points you make, and maybe what I'm sure that might be something that the, the either the, either the, the this committee or the the audit office committee could could uh, look at in terms of comparing costs of delivery with. Uh, other regions like Scotland, like the, the Irish Republic, that have, have a, have a centralised delivery, isn't compared to compared to Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks, Simon Gordon. I'll speed the thing along a little bit because I'm conscious of all the members and timing. You referred in your document about the Loch Ness Sand a, a decision coming up, yep. which is a valid point. Moving on from that somewhat, you referred here about CDE Global from Cookstown doing the uh, manufacturing sand from waste. What does that materialise in it in percentage ways? And is that a new technology? And how you know how far developed is it? And is it actually out there? Well, CDE are, as you rightly point out, uh, Keith, are, are a, a local company. Uh, they were actually one of our first affiliate members uh, back in the in the uh, in the, the early noughties, and they have developed into uh, a world leader in resource efficiency and, and circular economy. And I would certainly recommend anybody to. Get in touch with the company and go down and see their headquarters. Uh, it's, it's more akin to, to Google than to a, 
you know, in, in engineering and, 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 and minerals related uh, sector, but CDE, and I think this is a reflection of the engineering skills that we have in this part of the world, and uh, particularly in Mid Ulster. And as most of you probably know, around 60% of the quarrying and, and uh, concrete and recycling uh, plant and equipment uh, in the world is designed and manufactured in, in County Tyrone. And CDE have developed that expertise now around the world where they're they've introduced uh, screening systems and washing systems that's taking waste. For example, in Australia, uh, they have plant that, that, that companies are using in old landfill sites to go into the you know the mine basically landfill sites for 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 copper and, and metals that you know 30 40 years ago we were throwing away TVs and radios and things like that in South Africa they're supplying equipment to the uh, the mining industry there were you know diamond mines and gold mines in, in South Africa you know when the technology wasn't available that huge piles of, of overburden on these mines, and, and now with this new washing technology, they're going in and, and washing and getting like a, a nearly like a two percent return on the diamonds and the gold from simply washing that uh, that, that that material. In South America, uh, I'm aware that they, they they're now supplying equipment to uh, uh, mines, uh, the copper mines, etc., where traditionally, you know, they built up big tailings dams. And, and we heard last year of the, the disaster in, in Bolivia, I think it was, where a tailings dam had, had burst and uh, killed a uh, significant number of people. Uh, where their, their equipment and their technology is now negating the need for tailings dams by about 90%. You know, and that, that's, a, that's a, a wonderful, you know, technology uh, that's you know, the centre of it is here in, in Northern Ireland from, from our in, uh, engineering skills. And, and the application in Northern Ireland here, for example, now we're, you know, a lot of people, uh, companies are now washing, because there is, there is a concern of the, the shortage of sand around the world. Uh, we're now uh, washing, a lot of companies are washing their, their, the dust that they create in, in quarries to, to actually create a, what is called a concrete sand. And in some cases, uh, I don't want to mention the company's name, but it's, it's in County Tyrone, there, thirty percent of the aggregate uh, extraction in their quarry is now uh, dust, and they they are making sand. Thirty percent of the the, the material is, is sand uh, from from the dust within the quarry, and it's, it's all due to this new technology. And that that probably means that that company probably won't need to. One that the sand pits that they have is, is now exhausted, and they probably not need to. Uh, to buy a new a new site, you know. So there, there's a lot of ex innovation being used in the industry in terms of resource efficiency, and that's just a, an example. Okay, and this final question, Simon, you referred about the 160 extraction sites, and I don't want to sort of beat the ramps thing much further. But are many are many of those sites, you talk about a small number. Is that inclusive of the 160, or is that only 160 you keep an eye on? Is the ramps are the other sites over and above the 160 figure? So our members would be. 160, okay. and these other sites would not be members. Okay. But uh, honestly, I think you could count them on what one hand. Ones that, the ones that I am dealing with at the moment, there's probably about five. So it's it's a small minority, but small still number, a problem. Small number, but big impact. Big mm. problem. So, so you refer to the A5 project, I think, and, and whatever materials go into that road. How can that happen? That those is coming from those unregulated sites. That's a very good point, actually. Uh, something I was going to raise. You know, but a lot of it comes down to the fact of the way our construction industry works here in Northern Ireland. Construction has developed over the last 20 years almost into, you know, where, where uh, some main contractors are just project managers and they subcontract everything. And you get a main contractor uh, who is given this job and he subcontracts the, the, the earth moving to somebody and, he, and that subcontractor will... Uh, uh, they'll subcontract to somebody else, maybe the supply of stone. And the main contractor hasn't a clue where the, the aggregate's coming from. You know, I'll give you an example. The railway line between uh, Coleraine and Derry was done a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's actually, the, 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 I think it was a bit around Baller, Ballerine uh, that the Queen actually opened. And the company that, that uh, uh, 
was doing that when, when I contacted them about the aggregate coming from uh, uh, one of these reactivated quarries that, that the, the local council up there had an enforcement notice on. They weren't aware of it. Now, that, to be fair to them, they took action straight away whenever they became aware. And that, that has happened on a couple of occasions, and I, I pay tribute to those contractors for doing it. But the system's wrong. You know, and this is where I come back to the need for responsible sourcing requirements to be inbuilt in every public sector contract. Because a project manager on a, on a construction site, you know, it's not rocket science for that project manager when a lorry load of stone comes into the site, they ask for copies of the, of the delivery dockets and to be checking then where that material is coming from. Or another example is it's a, pub, it's a, it's a, public, a, it's a, a construction procurement uh, requirement that all concrete going to public sector jobs in Northern Ireland has to come from a quality assured site. And again, it comes down to the fact, ask for the docket, check where it's coming from. That's easily done, you know, in this day and age with, 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 with uh, uh, a lot of information up online. And it, it just comes down to this monitoring uh, on wh wh of where materials are coming from. And I think, as I said, we look forward to the, the start of the, the transport hub and to see how that uh, adherence to the responsible sourcing standard uh, is met. Okay. okay thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Ms. Anderson? Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm hoping I'm not too loud here. Am I okay? You're fine. Right. Hello? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we sorry. Uh, Simon, um, I would like to pick up on something you said. I went back to the previous briefing that the committee received on the 18th of May, and then in today's briefing, and given the two major, well, two of the major uh, problems that you face being Brexit and COVID. I'm surprised that the committee hasn't had a written brief from yourselves, and it would be something that I personally would find, I think, in our delegation find helpful to receive that on the implications of Brexit. When you said about the long-term supply of the quarry products and the 5,000 people that are there, uh, Cahill, Liz and I, and I'm sure the other uh, parties are doing the same and we've had a number of meetings with different sectors and there's widespread dissatisfaction at the insufficient time that's been given to try to plan and prepare given that the clock is ticking uh, to the end of this year and in order to try to get their systems in place to deal with two different fat systems, custom declarations and a harder border and border posts in the Irish Sea. Um, have you fed in your concerns how all of that will impact on your sector to the Minister and to the Executive? Um, yes, thank you. That's a, a good question. I, I'm going to ask Gordon. To... Yeah. Well, Mart Martina, uh, as you probably maybe you're not aware, but I have been part of the, the Northern Ireland uh, business breakfast, breakfast, and you said breakfast there. Uh, Brexit group uh, chaired by, by Ian Connolly. I think one of the one of the reasons I'm sitting in that group is because we, we, as a as an industry, uh, as a construction materials industry, depend very much on supplies into the GB uh, construction market, and there's quite a lot of uh, precast concrete and, and high quality aggregates go across the the RSC into the into Scotland and uh, and into the, the the GB market. Now. There's been long established supply chains developed over the last 34 years that are now uh, in grave danger. And we have depended on, and you've heard it I'm sure many times yourself, the, the backload principle. And, and you know, uh, the, the, the competitiveness of our construction materials supply into and, and the GB market depends on those, those supply chains. And obviously, with the increased friction uh, across the RSC, with our, you know, with our, our agri-food sector and, and other sectors that, that that's going to create, has a, a, a real is a real threat to that uh, competitiveness of our industry because of the, the lack, you know, the reduction in ships. We've already seen it with Stena Line P and O reducing sailings. Uh, and, and that obviously, you know, will result in increase in, in costs, uh, etc. 
The other big concern we have, and, and it's, it's one of the things I keep raising at, at the group, is the need not to forget about the, 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 uh, the labour issue uh, uh, and the, uh, the human aspect of Brexit in terms of you know, mobility of workers, uh, qualifications, recognition of qualifications. And that, that has been somewhat lost in the debate at the minute because of the, of the discussion over goods, which is rightly, you know, uh, is, is, is taking a priority at the minute. But, uh, you know, uh, Stephen Kelly, who you know very well, uh, uh, and as a good colleague of mine, you know, keeps talking about, you know, we need clarity, we need mitigation, we need compensation. Uh, and, and clarity, I think, at the minute is critical. And, and you're probably all aware of the, the paper that the, uh, the business group uh, produced last week. And uh, I'm aware that, that uh, uh, further discuss discussions are taking place. But we're, we're concerned mainly around the, the, uh, the, 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 that, that supply chain and how the, the frictions that, that will affect the, the supply of uh, you know, goods uh, across the RSC will then impact on the, the goods going the other way uh, into the GB market. I hope that sort of clarifies it for you. Yeah, and we've heard a lot about the unfettered access from here um, into the British market. I think that will um, have its own complications as that unfolds, particularly for uh, trade at the other end and traders feeling maybe there's an unfair competition. But even leaving that aside, um, um, you talked about the paper uh, with regards to what, what has been developed. The, the issue of the extension um, for the period, now we know that the majority of the parties in the Assembly, Scotland is calling for the extension and Wales is calling for an extension in the period of time that is left, given what you will face and you are already suffering because of COVID with the backload and um, because we know the difficulties that that has caused. Um, given the difficulty, all of that, have you been quite strong in firming up your position and is there a uniformed view um, in the group that there should be an extension because the, t the clock is ticking and it's going to, I think, be almost impro impossible to have the industry, not just your industry, but all trade that is taking place across the IRC prepared and ready and um, able to deal with the impact of what's coming at them. I can't, I can't speak for the others on, on the group, but uh, I, I would say that you know that most people I've talked to, yeah, we would like to see uh, an extension. However, given the the Conservative parties, and I don't want to delve into politics here, you know, the reality is that uh, the, the the Tories are going to you know get it through Parliament, uh, and I don't think there, there's anything that that we can do here in, in Northern Ireland or the Scottish Executive or the Welsh Government can do to, to stop that. I think our, our priority at the minute is getting clarity uh, for our members uh, so that any of them involved in that, that export of materials across the, the RSC you know, can make decisions uh, for the benefit of their business going forward. Yeah, and we know whenever it's happening, it's going to happen. There will be two fat systems. There will be custom declarations now. However, March, or I mean, the custom declaration was one we were hoping if there would be an extension that all of that could resolve itself because the last thing we want is a crash out Brexit, and we know there's going to be border posts in terms of checks. And um, so, I suppose it's about the industry too being prepared for that because none of those are going to go away. There may be, you know, lesser degrees of the applications of them, but that's that those implications are there, and we've known that to, uh, for a long time. Um, and I don't want to, I'm not at all trying to drag you in to one political side or another, but it's just about this makes sense uh, for, for an industry to try to be prepared for all of that. And in the context of a crash out Brexit, I think that there are many people uh, hearing what you're saying, and we need more people in Europe to understand that that view, that, and of course they have the majority, and that will go through Parliament, but it's not the majority view of the sector here. And the kind of appeal that was made in the past to Europe, which was heard very well about ensuring the All-Ireland economy and the Good Friday Agreement was protected and there'd be no harder border in the island of Ireland, I think we need to make sure that the concerns of the industry 
is being heard there as well, and I'm sure Stephen Kelly and others are doing that. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much. Um, for the record, I would declare that I was... Sorry, can I just ask one more question? Sorry, it's, it's very difficult when you're not there, Chair, and I know this is... Okay. I'm not making it easy for you. But it was one question just, Chair, to ask in relation to uh, on roadworks. You know, how much uh, did the road maintenance work um, have to adapt in terms of COVID-19? And I'm saying this in relation to, you know, has the work slowed down due to necessary precautions? Because we, we got a briefing last week about money having to be surrendered for the A6 because of COVID, and then what provisions were put in place or have been needed regarding PPE for, for those workers who have continued to work and the workers now who are coming back on stream? Yeah, Martina, I, I said earlier on in, in, in the, my presentation that, that you know, when the COVID-19 hit, that most companies, you know, vo voluntarily and in terms of road construction, uh, withdrew their services because of the concerns and the uncertainty over COVID, and they they they, they wanted to allay the, the the fears of their employees and basically old risk assessments, old working practices were ripped up and and new ones developed, and those have been agreed with the uh, with the the, the the health and safety. Uh, department within the uh, within the department, I think uh, <clears throat> as I said earlier, there, we as as an industry have developed guidance uh, for our, our members and, and, and for their employees. Uh, obviously, there are many different aspects to, to roads maintenance. There are certain parts of it where uh, you know social distancing is is very very easy because it's mainly machine. There are men are in machines. There's other Areas around uh, like handling and, and, and footways where, where people are moving uh, close to each other, albeit for very short periods of time, uh, and where the need for for PPE uh, comes in. Uh, but as I said, I said earlier, uh, I don't think there's any other industry or sector within uh, in, in, in construction that, that leads in the way our industry do, does in terms of health and safety. And uh, I, I certainly haven't had any negativity over the last three weeks. And I, in fact, I've been out on a couple of sites. I've spoke to workers uh, myself, uh, and, and, and they, they, are, they are happy, they're content that their views, their concerns have been taken on board. And uh, let's all hope that uh, we're, we're not too far from you know, coming out of this. And uh, uh, I, I would pay a tribute, because there's been a lot, a lot of tributes paid over, over the the, and rightly so to a lot of workers in, involved in deliver, delivering essential services, but we've had uh, our members, you know, working over the last number, uh, couple of months, delivering essential supplies to farming, to the utilities, and to uh, other essential services. And I would pay a tribute to them as well. Yeah, and I, I would like to add our tribute to that, and I think you should pass that on because that is reassuring what you said. One final question, Chair, and it's in relation to the recommendations arising from the audit report. Um, are they being taken forward? Can you maybe be more specific in relation to that? Well, I mean, it was mentioned in the uh, in the briefing about the audit report, and there <coughs> was uh, and and there was talks about the delays that had taken place, and the uh, and the audit office had made recommendations. Um, I know that they it heard that other our, other committees are dealing with this, but I'm just wondering if those recommendations have been taken forward, and if the industry is working on those recommendations as well as obviously the department. Well, certainly, uh, uh, in, in one area, in terms of the you know the the, the, part, uh, the the report obviously talks about the need for longer term you know multi-year budgets, that's something that we have been called for and that decision has been made. Uh, I think there's a, a recognition uh, within the department now, and, and, and I think within all departments, uh, particularly finance, that you know, not only the audit office report, but the Barton report and the Snaith report uh, uh, said the same thing, that basically with an asset, they're a very valuable asset, we need to look after it uh, within the, the budget that's available, and I think the the evidence that, that the department have front-loaded the budget over the last three years 
uh, is evidence that that you know uh, that there is a uh, you know there's a commitment there to, to do all that we can uh, to ensure that we we uh, maintain the network and the asset uh, to the best uh, ability that we have within the resources we have. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to move on. We've got three okay. other members, okay. and we're limited for Thank time. You. Thank you. Both. Thank you. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, for the record, I declare as previously an employee of TransLink, um, also a member of Argent North Downborough Council, and my stepfather is a quality manager on the A6 project at Dungiven Bypass. So I think that's everything declared. Um, just a couple of questions. I agree with you around the, the infrastructure you put in place. It's not just for for um, for vehicles. It's also for cycling and it's for active travel. So it's important that that understanding is, is made around that. Um, you've already talked about it and we've already sort of discussed the whole issue of the potential impact of Brexit. I think that's something that shouldn't be underplayed. It's got a significant impact. Um, just a couple of questions, really. Um, in relation to the works taking place in urban areas, and um, so resurfacing uh, works, has that been in any way impeded as a result of the social distancing requirements? So this is, it works particularly in town and c city centres uh, around that. Um, and also, it's likely that and hopeful that the UK government will bring forward uh, a stimulus package in the autumn. That's what we're hearing, and I hope that there'll be barnet consequences arising from that. There's also a monitoring round in October as well, and it's just about how much your industry is fit ready to deliver uh, upon the projects if the money is forthcoming. Hopefully, uh, in the autumn. The I think I think the, the, the point you make about the the uh, the you know, TransLink and, and and public transport uh, is critical. At the end of the day, you know, we supply materials to uh, TransLink and in, in terms of railway ballast and, and concrete sleepers and, and, and as I said earlier, the, uh, the 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 public public transport depends on the materials that we supply as well. So I think for the uh, there needs to be and I think the COVID nineteen uh, experience. Has highlighted, you know, the need for uh, the, the the green recovery, and we hope to play a very very important role in that. Uh, sorry, what was the, your, your other point? And also, the infrastructure is <coughs> used for cycling as well, which is important to yes. understand because cyclists are going along roads which are rather, you know, not in a great state and are quite dangerous. But the issues around social distancing requirements and how that's impacted from works in urban areas. Yeah. You're absolutely right, and it, it, it has caused. And in fact, you know, when we were discussing this at the at the, the start of a return to work, concerns were raised within the industry, and additional measures have had to be put in place. For example, the appointment of a COVID-19 uh, officer in in a squad, you know, to ensure, in, in terms of the, the, the traffic and pedestrian management around, particularly in, in housing estates, and you know, to keep people. Uh, make sure they follow the the, uh, the the allocated pedestrian routes, and that that uh, that, that people aren't uh, you know coming into the into the roadworks or, or coming into closer contact with uh, with with uh, work personnel. So there has been there has been a need for for extra resources to be put in. And to be fair, and I, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, I would pay a tribute to the department in their uh, their support for the industry during this time uh, when the when the uh, the procurement guidance note came out from the cabinet office around the devolved administrations. The DFI uh, were very, very quickly out with a letter in terms of uh, supplier relief uh, to the industry. Uh, we're actually working with the department at the minute to identify those areas where you know uh, ex additional support is required, and, and that's one in, in particular where you know additional resources have had to be the, be uh, applied within. Uh, Urban areas to ensure proper uh, social distancing, with with a focus on inter interaction with the general public. Of Some of the work's not been able to proceed because of the requirements. I think in the er in the early stage, yes. I'm aware that there was a couple of projects were delayed until yeah. proper. You know, there was a wee bit more uh, in depth look uh, looking at the, the 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 challenges around those specific projects. But as as far as I'm aware, uh, th those projects then went ahead. This is about October monitoring and Barnet consequentials and the ability to sort of progress at a pace. We have, the industry has capacity at the, yeah. at the moment, but it also goes back to what the <coughs> chair said earlier. And if we could have consistent spend over 12 months, 24 months, it's better value for the taxpayer. <coughs> but there's capacity at today. Yeah. I think the other important part is this, and it's, it's the argument that, that I've used consistently over the years that you know there were a, uh, there were 
a couple of years, as, as members will, will remember, you know, where we were down to, you know, the, the 50s and 60 millions, you know, and, and we had to lay people off, you know, which was a skilled workforce. If you get to the end, you know, we're in a situation now where the budget, you know, we're up at the 75, 80 million indicative budget. That's what I said earlier about keep, it's like keeping the pump primed, that if we are operating at that level now, if in the, <coughs> excuse me, if in the next couple of months the department come with another 20, 30 million, it's very, very easy then for the, the industry to gear up because we're at a certain capacity. But if we're down at a, a very low capacity, it's virtually impossible. And, and indeed, that's reflective of the department as well in terms of the resources they have. Because remember, there's people in the department that have to put these schemes together and deliver them uh, and develop the works orders. So it's, it's, it's not just about the resources within the industry, it's the resources within the department as well. Okay, thank you. Fine. Mrs Kelly? Well, thank you, and thanks very much for your presentation. Um, can I just go back a wee bit about the apprenticeship? You know, and I just wondered about how the apprenticeship levy uh, rolls out across the industry. That's a very good question. Uh, well, you're probably aware of, of our position on the apprenticeship levy uh, and the the origins of it. Uh, we're very, very sceptical of it. It was a, a back of the cigarette packet job uh, before the election. Uh, you know, in Northern Ireland, apprenticeships at that time were working very well, and this is through a, a, a spanner in the works. And the, the the frustrations of the industry at that time was that the apprenticeship levy was coming back unhypothecated, really, in the in the in, in the Barnet consequences, and uh, there was no real evidence yet. Yet companies here putting money in. Uh, to paying money into, and indeed many parts of the public sector as well, paying into it, where you weren't actually seeing the the detail of it. So uh, it's something that's that's we're very focused on, Ms. Kelly. Uh, our industry has a, a very high age profile, and we're we're, we're currently carrying out a, a a survey, which we do every every couple of years, into the age profile, but also now this time the, the diversity. Uh, within the industry as well, because we want to uh, increase the, the level of, of, of female representation in, in our industry. But it's something we work we work very closely with CITB. Uh, uh, we also work with uh, Alexa Work Plus with Richard Kirk, and uh, we're very focused on, uh, on a number of our, our members, particularly in the roads uh, section, sector, uh, have taken on uh, apprenticeships, road, road, roads maintenance, and, and highway uh, engineers. Uh, on, a, on apprenticeships. Yeah, from what I'm hearing across the various sectors, the apprenticeship levy isn't delivering. Mm. No. Uh, that, that's what I'm hearing. Um, the, the economy minister and others are focused on particular the recent news about how young people in particular would be most adversely impacted by any oncoming recession. And there have been some verbal commitments given about <coughs> industry working alongside further and higher education. I'm just wondering what engagement, uh, if any, has your sector had on that type of panel or within that debate? <clears throat> well, we're part of the, uh, the, the, the built environment sector partnership uh, that, that, that's uh, facilitated by CITB, <clears throat> and there's an apprenticeship review going on at the minute. Uh, <clears throat> we've been part and parcel of that. Uh, the, we've, we've also good linkage in with uh, South West College in mm -hmm. particular. Uh, who we, we, we work regularly on, with, with and, uh, particularly around the, the whole areas of, of engineering and uh, the decarbonisation agenda as well. Uh, it's, it's a difficult one because, you know, our industry traditionally is, you know, up early in the morning, mm -hmm. home late at night, it's, it's mm -hmm. hard work out in all types of weather. And with the choices that young people have, <laughs> no. I, we, we, we do, we, we have a challenge, which is important, which is one of the reasons why our, our, our executive committee, you know, are, are totally committed to, to, as Simon says, improving the image of the industry, mm -hmm. improving, you know, investment in technology. Uh, you know, uh, you know that we, have to, we have to change as an industry. And, and you know, with, 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 we, we're, we're now looking at artificial intelligence, where, you know, the engineering side of our industry, the, the, the precast, uh, mm -hmm. sector uh, of which we have now the three largest precast manufacturers in, in, uh, in, in the UK 
you know, they're, 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 they have a relatively low age profile because it's, it's around you know CAD technology. It's a, it's office based. It's it's off site construction now, uh, but in the core. And this, you know, the, the, the road contracting, the, 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 the quarry, uh, the, the extraction end of the, the, the industry, it's, it's still a challenge to, to attract young people. Yeah, I, I do know of some who have gone to England with logistics degrees and all sorts of things, and much higher salary seems to be attracting people. But if there was a particular ask from uh, you of this committee, what would it be? <sighs> particular ask? I, I think, well, on the planning front, Ramps mm -hmm. uh, on the uh, on the procurement end of things. It's the the yeah. the, the, the the single the delivery unit, yeah. and uh, I just think on on on, an on on an ongoing uh, basis is just completely you, know, com you know recognizing the importance that our industry has to the economy, uh, to so many aspects in the housing, leisure, yeah. s you know, sport. Everything. And, and supporting us in, in, in terms of uh, where we're going in the future, in terms of, you know, uh, attracting young people into the industry and, and the decarbonisation uh, agenda, uh, I think that's critical. And uh, you know, government in Northern Ireland purchases 45 to 50 percent of all the materials that we produce. You know, there's a real potential incentive there. Uh, you know, ensuring that materials come from responsibly sourced. Uh, 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 sites and, and clam, clam, uh, you know, stopping uh, you know rogue operators uh, that, that that compete then against responsible operators. Thank you, Chair. I think that's maybe something we might take up uh, Nilga and Solis as well in terms of their enforcement officer teams. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kimmins. Thanks, Chair. And just before I start, I think it's very important to note, in my opinion, you are the your chair on the meeting. Whenever members are tapping their watch at, at the chairperson to um, hurry along a member, I think it's very disrespectful. And you know, it's particularly when the member's not even in the room, you know, especially when other members don't, don't take their own advice. So I just want to make that point, because I'm happy enough to wait until my turn to make a contribution. Each and every one of us have the right to, to make our points. So I just think members need to be aware of that. But thanks, uh, Gordon and Simon, for, for coming today. I think it's been very informative. It's my first time. Um, meeting you both and a lot of the points that I was going to raise have been covered um, but it's just around the plan and I suppose um, we would be very um, supportive of, of a review of plan I think there are a number of issues and I'm coming from a council background as well so well aware of it um, so just I suppose to get your view on you know other than the points you've made is there anything in particular you'd like to see as an industry coming out of that review again I would emphasize what we believe is a uh, uh, a shared service in terms of mineral and uh, uh, waste planning, but don't take anything really to do with with with, with waste. But those are two very uh, specific uh, types of, of planning. Uh, you know, if you, if you took the number of quarry applications that go in every year compared to the overall number, uh, it's very small, but they they can be controversial. They you know, at a local level. Uh, yet they are, are vitally important, you know, in terms of the supply chains uh, that are, are delivered within the economy, and that goes back to my point that, you know, we, we need to improve the, the the knowledge, the experience, and the uh, the competency of the people that may, are making those decisions within uh, within the the, the, the councils or any 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 agency at all, yeah. really. Yeah, and just I suppose one of the things during COVID that you know. Even just at a basic level, in terms of, of, of smaller applications, but uh, you know, we talked about um, delays and barriers to the larger applications. Do you think that um, because there's been, I suppose, a, almost a complete stoppage of construction, things like that, where planning applications are due to lapse, would an extension be you still useful at this stage, um, coming out of COVID, for planning applications that maybe haven't been able to get off the ground just yet? It's something I have mentioned with the minister on a number of occasions. So it's just to kind of get your viewpoint on that. Yeah, I, th I think there's a number of other sectors have have, have raised that issue, yeah. and certainly, you know, there's been so many other aspects of, you know, uh, whether it be MOT, whether it be training, for example, where processes had to stop, you know, during the pandemic. I think it's right and proper that you know extensions can, should be given. 
Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr Hilda, did you want to come in very briefly? Yes, thank, thank you. Uh, we talked a lot about regulations uh, over the ramps issue and whatnot, but turning it around a little bit and maybe gamekeeper turned poacher. Uh, I was dealing with an issue sort of last autumn time locally where uh, one of your well-known companies was dumping in a unlicensed landfill uh, came to light. Also, a local council were doing it as well. But what should that company have been looking for? What would be the process? To they shouldn't have just turned up, obviously, by somebody telling them of the site. Should there not be some sort of well, I have, I have, documents I have, or something? I would have thought they should be following the the letter of the law. It's up to them to oh, uh, absolutely. Do that, One thing yeah. about us, like, we, as an association, we won't we won't stand over. Any you know member that that, that that steps out of the law, you know that, that they have to take that on yeah. their on their there, there are art, art, things within our articles of association that there are certain things if, if something happens and they they, they, they go um, any member goes against the the policy or the core values of our of association. There there are procedures there that they could be uh, suspended or, or chucked out. Yeah, but there there's a. There's a regulation on that. There's a real paper trail as to how that should be done legally. I would have thought so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. A very brief just quickly, Chair, question. I mean, a very brief answer. Absolutely. No, and and even who doesn't have to respond, but just to be reminded, because Gordon, you mentioned the audit report, and one of my colleagues had talked about it. The three key points was recently has come up: multi-year budgets, procurement process, and also the planning. And those are the three. Main things is based on, on a number, but certainly in the major capital projects, you're you are keeping an eye on that and you are focused on those three points. Just want to raise that. Final comment? No, no, absolutely. Look, we, we we greatly value the opportunity coming here today, and and it's always it's always good to, for us to, to keep you abreast of, of what's going on at the ground level in the in the industry. And I said <clears throat> at the start of the meeting, you know, the. The, the regular communication that we have with <coughs> departmental officials, so that things are done efficiently and uh, efficiently, and that we can, you know, continue to deliver value for money. You know, and the the uh, the uh, the fact of the matter that that uh, still in Northern Ireland, uh, the, the the department gets the best value for money of of, of uh, construction materials of, of any region within these islands. Uh, that's still that's still there, and we, we look forward to. Uh, continuing that over uh, the, 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 the coming years. Okay, well, can I thank both of you very much for coming thank this you. morning, for taking the time to present and obviously yeah. to take questions. Um, I value certainly the communication that, that we that we have and, and hopefully that will continue. Um, and certainly you've raised a number of points here this morning, which we will we'll follow up on. Yeah. Thank uh, you I will add that, that, that it, will be, it will be great, you know, when the COVID pandemic is, is, is over and, and the social distancing is a thing of the past. But, I'd like to invite the committee to come out to see one of our modern sites and maybe look at some of the, the innovations that's going on and, and particularly you know do a, a check on how we're getting on with the the, the decarbonisation and energy transition. Yeah. We, look for, we look forward to that. Okay. Hopefully in the not too distant future. Thank you okay, very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your questions. I was impressed with your questions and it's given <laughs> us some thought as well. And we go back to our members for more discussion. Okay, thank good you. luck, Nick. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, members, we've quite a bit to do and this was the next sort of 15 minutes before we have to leave so um, just really to to wrap up this end of the, se the session if you're content that we write to the department just to receive an update in relation to where they are on romps um, ask their consideration in relation to the shared expert service um, in relation to minerals uh, and waste um, and it might actually be useful maybe also to write to the agriculture committee with regards to that because obviously this um, the waste element of that. Mm -hmm. um, also include in the correspondence just their view on the specialised construction project delivery unit and, and also their thoughts in relation to establishing a, a Northern Ireland um, Minerals Forum. Uh, there were a number of questions in the, in the briefing um, which may be, need to be directed then towards um, Department of Finance, just sort of the broader issues around um, what's been spent and so on. I think we can maybe pick those up from the briefing. Members of anything else they'd like to include in that correspondence? Um, Dolores, you'd yeah, mentioned just about that, yeah. following up with Nilga and Solis. Yeah, it, it just seemed that they were suggesting that the enforcement powers which councils do have are not being exercised, mm. and perhaps we could ask 
about that, you know, particularly in those quarries that they're saying that are operating. Okay, members, members content with that? Okay. Um, there's also, the, um, Mr. Beggs had raised about the specialised construction project and maybe a comparative study um, with other regions. Would the members feel it useful if we asked research perhaps maybe to look at a piece of work on that initially? Okay. Just done? Yeah, that'd be good. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving then to correspondence, um, draw your attention to the memo at page 26. Um, at page 2, 194, the examiner statutory rules 12th report draws attention that two statutory rules that breach the 21 day rule. Um, the committee had previously agreed these two statutory rules subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. Um, the examiner of statutory rules is content with the explanation given by the department for the breach. Um, so are members content in relation to SR um, 2020-64, the Taxis Licensing Amendment Coronas Virus Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. Um, are the members content with this rule? Okay. okay. So that the Committee for Infrastructure is considered SR 2020-64, the Taxi Licensing Amendment Coronavirus Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and had no objection to the rule. Um, are members, any other thoughts in relation to? We've also got. Oh, we've got the coronavirus one as well. Sorry, SR 2020-72, the Planning, Development, Management, Temporary Modifications Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Are members content with this rule? Great. Okay, so that the Committee for Infrastructure is considered SR 2020-72, the Planning, Development, Management, Temporary Modifications Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and a no objection to the rule. Um, just want to flag up another piece of correspondence, which is at page 309, um, and that's correspondence from the Committee of Finance, and they're seeking our views as to which department we feel would be responsible for bringing forward proposals to provide support to the road haulage sector. So I think we've, we have rehearsed this a number of mm -hmm. times, but um, I think our view was that there was a, should be a joint approach, as there had been towards the ports. Um, I'm not sure whether other members are have a view on that, Ms Kimmins? Yeah, sure. I actually had a meeting last week with um, some of the hauliers and with um, the road haulage association, so they're still saying that they've had very little, if any, engagement from either minister, and it's becoming urgent now because they're really in, you know, not all are in the same position, but because of the nature of, of the work, it's, it's, it's very... Um, it's nearly they would need a bespoke package, so it's really just if we can go back to both ministers and say, you know, this needs to be looked at urgently, and hopefully, um, the, the Road Haulage Association have said that the ministers sh should have all the information they need that they have forwarded on. If, the, if there's anything lacking, they're they are willing to give it. But I think as time's ticking on, you know, we really need to make sure that there's support available. And um, so it's just if we are able to to emphasize that with the ministers. Okay, Mr. Boylan. No, I just agree with my colleague. Yeah, Mr. Mean, Muir, no. had you something to add to that? No, I'd agree with that. I've got another issue, but we'll come take it on later on. So. Okay, until then we go back with that. Um, Ms. Anderson, is it tapping there? Are you wanting to speak? Uh, no, I'll come in under AOB when you're finished, if you don't mind. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we've got correspondence then at page 312. And that's from the Department for the for Infrastructure, just regarding our correspondence. Um, and that was a number of issues. Do members have any comment in relation to that? Are you content to note at this stage? Yeah, right, Chair. That's, okay. the, that's the one I was talking about there, but her, the Minister's response to it. All right, okay. Sorry, I thought it was what you were talking about. Okay, so um, are you content then with the actions which are listed for correspondence? Yes? Yeah, okay, great. thank you. Uh, moving then to item 7, which is SR 2020-99. The um, Drum Lagoon Road and <coughs> Garden Hill Road ported down abandonment order, Northern Ireland 2020. So this is page 318. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 29th of April 2020, and we were content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There's been no change in the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are the committee content with the rule? Members content? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-99, the Drum Lagoon Road and Kernan Hill Road, Port Down, Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. 
Item 8 is SR 2020 100, the footpath at Moen Road and Bunker Hill and Market Hill Abandonment Order Northern Ireland 2020. And this is at page 326. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 29th of April 2020 and was, and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Great. Great, Chair. That's the Moan Road. Moan, OK, thank Perfect. you. That the um, Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-100, the footpath at Moan Road and Bunker Hill, Market Hill, Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Report, is no objection to the rule. Great. Thank you. SR 2020-101, the Carnan Road, Order Down, footpath, Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and this is at page 334. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 29th of April 2020 and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Great. Great. Thank you. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-101, the Kernan Road, Porter Down, Footpath Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Great. Item 10 is SR 2020-102, the Craigs Road Carrick Fergus Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and this is at page 342. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 29th of April 2020 and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with the rule? Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The, the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-102, the Craigs Road, um, Carrick Fergus Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Please. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Moving then to item 11, which is our forward work programme, and it's at page 350, um, and that's the work programme to the, um, the week um, of the 8th of July. Um, we have briefings from representatives from all four ports, um, from, um, and that's from for next um, next Wednesday. That meeting actually might be quite difficult for us, in so much as we're going to have four representatives. And if we're asking one question, then four people may want to answer. So I suppose it's really just about managing ourselves and, and managing the time. I suppose so. I think maybe just be it's two weeks. For two weeks time. I'm running ahead of myself. No, you're okay. Right. Well, thinking ahead, um, just maybe we need to consider that as well, and maybe okay. what, what time we have as well, and how, mm. and how we and how we organise that. Two hours. We only have two hours, so we may have to consider Thank maybe you. the types of questions that we want to ask, and then how we manage that meeting. I think maybe just give consideration to that, um, because we, you know we saw how time ran with us today. So, okay. Um, sure, just on the other two briefings that we have side of that. I mean, Ms Kelly mentioned last week um, in terms of see the departmental briefing on roads and also the minister. Could we get a wee update maybe in the road safety strategy or, you know, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. If we can fit something in, even a briefing of some. Yeah, or even if we could ask, even if we could ask, maybe even for a, a maybe a written briefing, even just as an update at this stage, would it's that be useful? Just a number or of deaths in just about our, May and our time. So doubled. So it's just to get a wee idea. Because I think we should keep it under a constant review. Yeah. yeah. And just to see where we're at. Yeah. Yeah. Next, next week is going to be um, the two, rules briefing, two and briefings. the rivers and flooding is going to move to after summer recess. Okay. Because right. we can only have a two-hour slot. Right, and okay. then by right, we'll sure, right, get a written briefing, and maybe we can. Well, well, maybe we could ask, we'd ask for a written briefing at this stage, yeah, maybe, well, if that's, that's okay. okay. And and also, if we could maybe get a, a, a written briefing in relation to um, the department and how it's handling sort of Brexit-related issues as well, it might be useful for us to have mm -hmm. that, yeah, um, if yeah. you're content. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so members happy enough? Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, moving then to any other business. Ms Anderson? Hello? 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 Yeah, Hello, sorry. Um, I want to go back, please, and just uh, raise my concern as someone who's not in the room, and this is the first time that I have missed um, a meeting under these conditions. But, you know, I think that I, I want to commend, Chair. I know you try your best to uh, to keep us uh, within the time limit that, that we have, and we all try to coordinate. But as members, we all know we have a role in scrutiny, and it isn't appreciated 
um, by certainly um, by, by the Sinn Féin members that for anyone to ha- to be sitting tapping their watch when another member is speaking when they're not in the room. I asked three questions, Brexit, PPE and the Audit Office. And I think there's obviously more, as you would know, that all of us could ask uh, in these times. So I just think that we all need to understand what roles we have. You may be, when you're in the chamber, when you're in control of that environment, you may be able to stop members from speaking. But I'm hoping that you're not influenced by someone doing that. And I appreciate the fact that I was able to engage in the meeting in this format today. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Muir? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I had a meeting yesterday with the Federation of Passenger Transport Representatives, which is the private coach and, 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 and bus hire company. Um, and obviously they're facing a very difficult situation because of the complete downturn in trade mm. um, and the real potential collapse of the um, tourism industry in terms of uh, you know, out of state. Um, this touches upon the other issue about who's responsible for giving the assistance, whether it's economy or infrastructure or both. But I don't know whether it would be appropriate to write to both ministers to see what they're considering to do and to support them because they still have their, their, their fees to pay for you know, their leases and finances, their insurance to pay, obviously the furloughing scheme's running down, but yet there's no business booked you know, really for the, for the term ahead. Obviously their school's business, but that's not going to cover their Of course, very mindful that. of the decision that was taken by TransLink as well in relation yes. to the Ulster bus tours. Are members content that we write? Yeah, just sure. The only observation I would have is part of the wider tourism and hospitality. Yeah. Yes. And I think members have said that we can't save everybody. You know, yes. that's the big problem and the big challenge to us all. But I think it's right that it's highlighted. Yeah. Yeah. We get to have them, you know, on the yeah. other side of this. We'll, we'll I think that's, yeah, companies. I think certainly in normal circumstances, we certainly would have had them here already. Yes. Um, but as but column we're given where we are. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mr. Boylan and then Mr. Beggs. Yeah, yeah, just um, Chair, in, in light of what was said this morning, the briefing this morning, I know we, we got um, the capital budget review and we, we, we've got the Minister's indication, but I would like a more detailed um, report in relation to the capital or capital spend. We'd like because, to think that whenever she. Yeah, we'll, yeah I know what she's coming to, it's just to give her a heads up on that because we have a good opportunity to kickstart the economy again in, ter- in terms of what they were saying this morning. And, I think all that, th- those road projects, certainly, and I don't think we'd have any issues just to get it before the breakdown, but the Minister's comment. Well, certainly the statement me. probably raised an awful lot of questions just in relation to um, rural schools with the 20 miles an hour, the park and rides, which cites those, and we'll all have uh, there's loads submitted of lots, right of, across lots, all of, of, yeah, there's lots yeah. of questions yeah. in and around that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Had, yeah. no, no okay. um, Mr enough. Beggs and then Mr Buchanan. In the past week, the Minister's issued a written statement on strategic roads and flagship road schemes. Now what I find surprising about that statement uh, is that it refers to the A5, the A6, A1, A2, A4, the A29, the A2, the A32, but there's no mention of the York Gate interchange, which I understood to be one of the most important schemes to improve the Northern Ireland economy and to reduce pollution in that area with all the traffic which is currently parked up during uh, peak periods. So uh, I'm just curious why there is no mention of that scheme in a statement around strategic roads and flagship road schemes. And I think as a committee we should be seeking uh, guidance from the Minister of what is going on with that scheme. Okay, we seek an update in relation to that. But again, that statement came out and it gave us a tour of Northern Ireland with very little um, detail in relation to what was the status of each of the schemes or indeed what money was going to be spent to progress each of those schemes as well. So again, that, that, there's further questions that perhaps we need to, to ask, ask the Minister on, but I'm content obviously that we write in relation to York Street Interchange. And finally, Mr okay, Buchanan. Thank you. Just on page 308, there's a correspondence from a gentleman, Mr Paul Wilson, and obviously we're agreeing to forward to the Department for comment. Just to get clarity, he has a point there. You know, are we concerned about the, the two million? Are concerned about the hundred hundred schools? Just you know, what is the the target for the hundred schools, or the, or whenever the two millions out? He, he certainly has a point because a lot of schools are thirty mile. It's not all about the flashing sign, which is expensive, I appreciate. But if it's only a pure change, you could maybe increase that number of schools. Although I think that that project came alongside um, the flashing signs, so yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose that might be the, the difficulty if it, with regards to that. Then you're but just to get clarity, but is it going to be the figure? Whether the schools or the money figure. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, 
just advise you that whenever you're, you're leaving the room to ensure that you maintain your social distancing and to remove all your papers and the water jugs and glasses from the meeting room as well when you leave. The date and time of the next meeting will be in this room on the 24th of June at 10 a.m. The meeting's now adjourned. Thank you very much. I'm signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed.